we go. Okay, now I'll do the introduction. So, um, okay, well, thank you for joining us and welcome to the Wild Welfare and Global Animal Welfare series of webinars. We're delighted to have Dr. Samantha Ward to give our latest, uh, well, our latest and our last webinar of the year. Sam is a senior lecturer at the Animal Science uh, Department in Nottingham Trent University and manages the undergraduate bachelor degree course on zoo animal biology. She has both practical and managerial zoo expertise and sits on DEFRA Zoo Expert Committee, the IASA Animal Records Working Group and the BIASA Research Committee. Sam also contributes to many uh, academic publications and her research focuses on zoo animal welfare science. Uh, in particular, the impact of uh, human animal interactions and human animal relationships um, and, and those relationships on zoo animals and investigates how zoo animal husbandry and management techniques impact and improves captive welfare. Uh, and Wild Welfare is fortunate to have Sam as an advisor and uh, we worked together and published animal welfare research. So I will pass over to you now, Sam, and you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll just check that everyone can see. Yeah, looks great. Oops, that out of the way and we'll make sure that it can yeah it moves okay so um yeah thanks simon thanks nick for having me um it's a pleasure to to talk to you this evening um and thanks everybody for joining us as well for whatever time zones you're in or whatever uh you know whether it's just before tea or just before lunch whatever it might be um so i'm going to talk to you today about some of the research that i and some colleagues have been involved in for quite some time now um, and it's looking at the importance of keeper animal relationships and how they impact to animal care and animal welfare. And that's within the zoo setting. So I thought I'd start off by showing us our typical zoo um, with our very typical zoo enclosures. So as you can see, there's quite an array of variation with regards to the types of zoo enclosures that we now see within our daily, you know, our, our zoos around the world. And so these can range from anything uh, like the normal um, window screen where you're standing watching animals from behind the glass, um, or it could include walkthrough enclosures where the animals are clambering all around. Um, and then it potentially could include some even more interaction, which might be feeding or touching or holding particular individuals as well. So those of you that know me uh, will know that I do love a definition um, and I feel like you can't get to grips with any topic until you've really got uh, the definition down. Um, and so to share with you what the official definition is of a human animal interaction um, is kind of this uh, image in front of you here. So essentially it's the idea that um, a human uh, will do something in or around, or you know, it might be just even the general presence of a, of a human um, that will then cause an animal to change its behavior. And it's that changing of the behavior that's really important um, with regards to that human animal interaction or whether it does change the interaction sorry, change the behavior or not. And so if we think back to these zoo enclosures again, and now with the, with the idea of the interaction in mind, you will be able to kind of think about how you might have an impact um, as a visitor or as somebody kind of interacting with an animal within these different types of enclosures. Now, these different types of interactions will vary, um, like I said, depending upon the species, depending upon the enclosure. And it was back in 1969 by a researcher called Heine Hedegger, who really started to kind of question these and theoretically uh, propose why or what it is that animals are seeing us as, as people within zoos. And he came up with these five potential um, hypotheses. And that is that an animal sees us as a prey item, as a symbiont, so a mutually beneficial relationship between the human and the animal, an enemy, part of the inanimate environment, or maybe a member of the same species. And so it's these five hypotheses that we started to kind of think about from the, the late 1960s. 
More recently, however, a friend and colleague of mine, Jeff Hosey, in 2013, actually revisited um, those hypotheses. And he wanted to, to look at what data was available um, to enable us to be able to, to quantify whether those five hypotheses were actually right or, or not. And so we started to look at, you know, whether it's published peer reviewed papers or whether it's in the media to see what data there is out there to support these different hypotheses. And these are the sorts of things that he found uh, with regards to the animal seen as, as an enemy. Um, so it might be human directed aggression. It might be hiding or withdrawing cover. Um, if you're thinking about um, the inanimate environment option, then it might be that the animals completely ignore you um, the interesting one there was the data that he found on a person using it, oh sorry, using in the person as a substrate, which I'm not sure quite what happened there, but anyway. Um, and then the third option is that, you know, the animal sees us as a member of his, his or own species. And so it might be human directed aggression or positive affiliative behaviors, or it might be that the animals approach you. So Hosey was able to essentially strike off two of these hypotheses because there was actually no data supporting these within all of the various different options and media that he found. And so essentially it comes down to the animals will kind of perceive us as a positive influence, a negative influence or a neutral influence, i.e. no inf influence at all. And so when it comes to visitor animal interactions, and that's just the general unfamiliar person within the zoo environment, um, there's lots of research now that's kind of covered these sorts of general topics. And again, the species and the variations between them will cover lots of different outcomes. So there's now data, or initially there was quite a lot of data in fact, which suggests that the visitors were having a negative impact on the animals. Um, but again, now we're seeing more that there's neutral impacts and there's also positive outputs there as well. So we're having quite a variety of different impacts on different species. There's so much research, in fact, that there's now even reviews on this particular topic. And a more recent review in 2019, and the reference is just at the bottom there, Sherwin and Hemsworth, um, they were able to show that you know, throughout all of these papers that have been published that look at visitor animal interactions, um, actually, it's more the external factors that might be having a bigger impact. So things like the weather, the enclosure design, and actually the individual animal responses themselves, which is actually causing these positive, neutral or negative implications. Now, one thing that all of these studies have had in common is that when they've looked at visitor animal interactions, they've mainly been able to focus on a low visitor number or a high visitor number. As we all know, the pandemic has led to a variety of different zoo closures all over the world for different varying amounts of time. And so I was involved with a team of researchers where we were able to, I suppose, um, take this opportunity um, of where the zoos completely had no visitors whatsoever, but were undergoing a normal daily routine in terms of feeding and cleaning. And so we were able to then measure this and when we compared that to then when the zoos were open again, we were able to look at how the animals are really influenced by the visitors when there was no visitors and when there was a, an increased number again. And again, our recent papers, so I've put the two down here um, and put the references at the bottom. Again, they showed a real variety in terms of the outputs. The majority of species weren't really that bothered by having the visitors back on site. Um, and some of them you know, were quite happy to see the visitors. Um, and again, you can read through these uh, various different articles to be able to see which species uh, were which. Um, but we did have quite an interesting particular species and that was one of the big cats. And that was actually found to, to be a little bit more wary of when the gates opened and the visitors came back to the zoos again. And interestingly, over a period of a couple of weeks, its behavior changed and it was actually completely ignoring the visitors again. So although it was initially quite wary of visitors, it was actually quite clear to see that it was only a really short amount of time until these animals habituated and got used to their new environments. And I think that's a real kind of telling um, story in the fact that the keepers and the zoos these days are providing such brilliant environments for the animals. So it might be enrichment, it might be changing the environment around them so that we're creating animals that are robust, that are adaptable and that are resilient to change. And that's really, really important within our zoo animals. So I'm not gonna to focus too much more on the, on the visitor side of things, but I think certainly with regards to the pandemic, it's quite a, a telling tale to tell. 
Um, and so it's useful to have that kind of as a background knowledge to show that we, we are influencing them even as visitors in zoos. But what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk um, is about the um, is about the, the sort of familiar humans. Apologies, I'm not sure if you can see that or whether it's hidden behind here or not, but never mind. Hopefully you can understand, I'll talk around it anyway. Um, but yeah, so the familiar humans within our zoos are, you know, the keepers that work with these animals, the trainers that work with these animals on a day-to-day -day basis. And those interactions, again, might be a little bit more personable than your general visitor. So it might be a little scratch as you walk past, um, or it might be involving animals within educational shows, or it certainly could be things uh, such as positive reinforcement training. Now, positive reinforcement training, which is the bottom right hand picture here, is something that I talk about um, quite a bit within the next uh, few slides. And essentially, it's where we're training animals, just like you would with your cats and dogs at home, um, to be able to perform specific behaviours. And it's based on a reward system. So every time an animal does what you want, you would reward it, whether that's with a whistle, like in this particular image, um, and then a treat. And so that's the idea that you're positively reinforcing a behavior that you want to see. And so it's that positive interaction between a keeper and an animal. Now, this sort of research where we started to look at familiar keepers or familiar humans around animals all started off within the farm industry. Um, and it looked at sort of negative stockmanship. So basically the attitudes and, and responses of, of farmers if they were in you know, negative moods and how that impacted um, on the production of farm animals. And this was all started early, you know, sort of 80s, 90s. Um, and so a lot of you know, the, the data was going back to farmers, you know, when techniques were a little bit old fashioned and they might use you know, sticks to move animals along. And it's not necessarily that positive environment. And they were able to show that with a, a negative interactions between farmers and pigs, it actually had a really negative impact on the growth rate of these animals. And it also negatively impacted on the reproduction. For dairy cattle, it was a similar sort of uh, story. So negative interactions between the farmers and the cattle meant that there was, there was a decrease in milk yield, protein and fats. So the quality of the milk and the amount of milk was reduced. And there was also an increased level of stress that was seen uh, within the cortisol levels, which is a hormone uh, that measures stress levels in, in mammals, basically. OK, so all of these negative interactions was having a real negative impact on the productivity levels of our farm animals, which, of course, is not really brilliant. Now, obviously, if we want to try and look at this kind of an area and this area of research within our zoo animals, we certainly don't want to be encouraging negative interactions and we don't want any of those pitchforks near our rhinos and our giraffes. So what we wanted to start and look at was the positive influences and was, was there any influence in a positive interaction and how would that then impact on our zoo animals? The next problem was that we don't really look at productivity rates, um, certainly not with regards to an interaction, which is quite a short term um, figure, I suppose. And so how would we then measure what the outputs would be? And that's where behavior comes in and measuring animal behavior. So the research world started looking into zoos, looking at positive interactions and how it impacts on animal behavior. And so it started in the early 2000s. Um, and there's a, a few papers that I've listed kind of general kind of over, overview on this slide here. Um, and just with 10 minutes of extra positive reinforcement uh, or sorry, positive interactions between the keepers and the chimpanzees, um, showed that the, the animals, the chimpanzees, were a lot more positively affiliative towards an observer where they were normally quite negative. And then in two other situations where there was colorless monkeys and there was gorillas, they increased the number, the amount of positive reinforcement training, which is again on this image here. Um, and they were then able to see that the, um, that the both sets of primates, so the gorillas and the colorless monkeys, actually um, with those positive interactions, retained their focus more on the social group of the individuals. So rather than interacting with the visitors, which is what they would do, so begging, uh, you know, kind of constantly watch it, watching the visitors, they actually spent more time focused on the group themselves, which again was seen to be quite a positive change. So this is where it all started. Um, and this is what kind of took my interest. And then I, 
um, started wanting to kind of do a bit of research this, I suppose, myself. Um, and so I wanted to look if training that the positive reinforcement training had a positive effect on keeper animal interactions. And we also wanted to look at whether there was any fearfulness of humans and whether that could then be reduced. So I used three different species. So Sulawesi black crested macaques, uh, black rhino and Chapman zebra. And I used and the, each of these different species had three different levels of positive reinforcement training. So we had one group of different species that would have um, fully kind of formed or fully organized uh, reinforcement training sessions. We would have groups of animals that were then kind of partially trained. So they might recognize certain cues from keepers and um, but they wouldn't necessarily undergo a formal training program. And then we had animals that were kind of pretty much just left to their own devices within their enclosures. And we looked at these with regards to um, how they also, the, sorry, the keepers also then um, measured their personalities. So they scored them on, on a personality scale. And so what I wanted to look at was, was the differences between the behaviors and the responses of the behaviors according to the level of training that they received. So these were the results. And again, you can have a look at the paper for more detail if you're, if you're interested. Um, but essentially, the social species that we measured um, had shorter behavioral responses than solitary species. So that was something that had never really been looked into before. And it potentially indicates that actually social species might be less fearful of humans. And it could be because they have their groups around them, their family around them, their, their friends around them. And so they've got that companionship so they can make a decision as a group or they send in the, the dominant individual first, and then they decide as a group how that response is then um, performed after that. As well, the effect of positive reinforcement training reduced the amount of time to perform different novel behaviors. So it wasn't that we were trying to test to see how the um, animals responded to behaviors that they already knew, it was just how they responded to completely new different, different behaviors altogether. And trained individuals were more willing to kind of trust the keepers, I suppose, um, and just do these sorts of behaviours and perform these behaviours in a much shorter amount of time. So essentially reducing the sort of amount of fear that, that humans might give to animals or animals might fear from humans. And the final thing that we kind of really looked at uh, was then looking at those, those personality traits. So within all of the groups, uh, whether they were formally trained, partially trained, or not trained, there were individuals that were uh, sort of, I suppose, allocated as being fearful of humans. And actually, the, the trained or the animals that were undergoing training uh, seemed to override that fear um, of an individual's performance. So they, they performed much quicker than individuals that were um, partially trained or not trained at all. And so essentially the positive interactions because of the positive reinforcement training might increase the fearfulness animal's perception or positive perception of the humans that are involved in its husbandry. So essentially I was able to kind of produce a zoo stockmanship uh, cycle or model. And you can see here that essentially those positive keeper animal interactions will lead to some positive responses from animals um, and then with that being quite, you know, all wonderfully happy, uh, it might then increase in positive animal welfare. And again, when you've got happy animals, you generally have happy keepers because things all go swimmingly well and animals do what, what you need them to do in the right amount of time. And so you're going to have those increase in positive um, keeper animal interactions again. So it will keep going around in a positive cycle. Now, interestingly, um, one of the, like I said before, one of the areas that I really was as that shocked me was this social component. Um, now, obviously with regards to our, our animals in zoos, they are genetically, well, they're bred to be genetically different. Um, we want to keep as much diversity within our zoo animals. And the other thing that we can't really control is the, um, the aspect of previous experience of humans. So we do know that animals that have positive experiences or past positive experiences are going to be more receptive to having you know, or being less fearful of humans. And so how do we get to grips with what the real kind of um, the bare beginnings is uh, with particular species? So basically, we used tickling rats. 
Um, and those of you that might know about tickling rats uh, will know what I'm about to say, but essentially, uh, those of you that don't, um, if anyone has rats at home, then you can Google and have a look on some of the videos on how to tickle rats. But essentially, tickling rats has been researched to find that it's a really, really positive experience for rats. They actually emit really high pitched um, kind of squealing noises in a, and that's been shown to, see, to be seen to be quite positive. And so they use it within a lab setting so that they can encourage positive interactions between the lab handlers and the, you know, the lab technicians and the animals so that the animals are not living in fear if they're going to be used for labs. And so how does this relate to zoo animals, you might ask? Well, it kind of doesn't, um, but it does relate to a study um, that a master's student of mine was involved in. So we had groups of rats um, and these were socially housed groups of rats in groups of four. And we had a variety, uh, I think it was three different groups of, of each four. Now, we had one group uh, or one set of groups of animals that were not interacted with apart from to be fed and to be clean. So a standard kind of husbandry procedure um, with no tickling. We had groups of rats that had two individuals that were removed and they were tickled for 10 minutes. And then we had groups of rats where all individuals were removed from the home cage and they were all tickled and they were all then put back. And so after these interactions, um, or at the same time for the for the zero percent, we then wanted to measure behavior. So we recorded the animal's behavior um, for 10 minutes afterwards. And we also took fecal samples and were able to then do um, fecal glucocorticoid metabolites. I hate saying that word in a presentation uh, or those words should I say, uh, which essentially are those stress hormones that I mentioned before. So we're able to measure the level of stress um, in the feces of these individuals. The results were really quite interesting. Um, so for those of you uh, can, can see this, hopefully, um, along the bottom here, you've got the amount of handling. So 0% HAI, then 50%, and then 100% as you go along left to right. Up the side, uh, on the y-axis, you've got the average amount of cortisol um, that's, that was measured within the feces. And as you can see, We've got a really higher or a higher level of cortisol that's measured in the no interactions compared to the amount of cortisol that's measured in the 100% interactions. And this was found to be significantly different. This essentially means that the animals that were not being played with or tickled were more stressed than the animals that were not. And interestingly, the, the bit in the middle or the, the blob in the middle um, also was kind of sat nicely in between. So it was having almost a, a quite a, an impact. So just having two individuals was still having a decrease um, in the stress levels compared to the uh, no interactions whatsoever. In terms of the behavior, um, again, hopefully this is, is quite nice and clear for you all, but you can see again the differences between the types of behaviors that were performed. So for individuals that were not having any interactions, there was a decrease in sniffing, so they weren't really investigating around their enclosure. Uh, and there was a decrease in sleeping, so potentially impacting on their uh, natural um, maintenance behaviours. Whereas if you look across at the 50% of tickling and 100% tickling, you can see really positive behaviours that were in increased and significantly increased. So there was an increase in play and wrestling, which is a form of, of rat interaction and play, increases in eating and drinking, self-grooming, running and walking. So they were a lot more active. They were a lot more kind of interactive between themselves as a social group, as well as utilizing their enclosure. So it was actually much, much more beneficial for the animals um, having all of the individuals played with and tickled. But interestingly, again, you can see that there were even increases in play and eating and drinking and walking uh, for the individuals that only where only two of them were removed and played with. So even just removing some of the social group to having some positive interactions was beneficial compared to non. Now, again, I'm not suggesting here that we go around and we tickle all of our zoo animals, um, but it just goes to show that actually, you know, some human animal interaction when you've got no prior experience can be seen to be quite a positive thing um, in response to behavior and welfare of, of kind of neutral animals, as it were. One of the other questions that I was interested in finding out is how do these interactions between our keepers and our animals impact on offspring? So a master's, uh, sorry, an undergrad student of mine um, was away over in, in Europe 
um, in a dolphin park. And so a dolphin gave birth and it was the perfect opportunity to be able to look into this. So he wanted to look at whether keeper training sessions impacted on mother and calf interactions in dolphins. And again, you can see this paper, it's an open access paper and you can read it for more detail if you're interested. But essentially what we wanted to look at was to see how the training routine um, that was on a daily, on a daily basis for the mums uh, or for the mother of this particular um, calf, um, after before, how they responded before uh, with the calf and how they responded after the interactions. So looking at the behavior before and after a training session. And these were the results. So again, you can see along the bottom here, we've got the various different behaviors. And in the blue columns, we've got the before trainer interaction. And in the orange column, we've got the after trainer interaction. And the upper left-hand side, uh, the y-axis, we've got the mean frequency. So again, you can see where these big black stars are. These are where there are significant differences um, according to the before and after. Um, certainly what was found was that some of the behaviors were increased afterwards and they were mostly the interactive uh, behaviors between the mother and the calf. And so generally there was a highly affiliative behaviors that were seen significantly more after the interaction than it was before. Now this can be interpreted two ways. Um, as you can see, it could be quite positive. So you're encouraging more interactions between the mother and the calf, which is great. Um, or it could be that actually you've disrupted those interactions. And so they're now having to do them after the event. But either way you look at it, it's still potentially gonna have that positive impact overall because there's no negative behaviors. It's not causing um, issues between the individuals. It's not taking time for them to rebond and rebuild those interactions again. So it's still quite a positive aspect, even though we don't know really the cause of why they're then increasing those affiliative behaviors. In addition, and something that would be really nice to, to go and, and do future work on, was looking at how then that impacts on the calf's interaction with those humans. Is that predisposed information and predisposed positive interactions with the keepers going to actually benefit that calf in the long run? Maybe that calf is going to go into, again, more displays or you know, uh, positive reinforcement training. And so is it gonna be more receptive to that because it's used to seeing its mum do that? And again, that's areas of research which hasn't yet been followed up on. Um, and it will be really interesting to look into in more detail and not just with dolphins either. Another study that um, I sort of led on from this um, was linked to the, the study that I was looking at with regards to the interactions. Um, and we wanted to look at um, if there was specific keeper animal dyads. So certainly, you know, if you're working in zoos and certainly as a zookeeper, when I was working uh, as that role, um, you do feel like, you know, certain animals respond differently to certain keepers. And this was wanting to answer those sorts of questions. And so we wanted to look at if specific dyads were formed, so pairs between particular animals and keepers, and whether they differed, whether keepers differed in their interactions towards any animals, and therefore how this might impact um, on you know, ultimately on animal behavior and welfare. So again, this was the same group of animals. So it was the rhinos and the cats and the zebra again. And essentially it was utilizing a similar sort of um, data, but not comparing according to um, positive reinforcement training. So what I was actually doing was timing how long it took for the animals to respond um, to a particular keeper. So um, it was all individuals and pairings and then being able to compare across that, uh, across the different dyads. And again, the results were really quite interesting. So some keepers did receive much quicker responses from some animals than others, uh, which did certainly lean to suggest that dyads between keepers and animals were formed, which meant that they were building up um, these keeper animal relationships. And then actually consistent interactions from the keepers um, meant that actually it was more the animal's decision as to what was happening um, and how it was responding then to the keepers rather than the keepers building that relationship. So although every single keeper was performing the husbandry tax tasks in exactly the same way that they've been trained, the animals were still responding differently according to that. And that was something again that was really interesting that no one had ever really looked into. And it started to kind of open these questions about keeper animal relationships. Now, more recently, um, I've been kind of looking into this area again, 
And it again started me asking myself questions about, you know, well, what is a human animal interaction and how does it differ from a human animal relationship? And how do we, you know, how do we know when we're really actually measuring human animal relationships? So I went back again, as you can probably imagine, to the definition. And this was the definition um, of a human animal relationship. And so it's a re result of repeated interactions, makes sense, between animals and humans, of course, um, such that each participant is able to make predictions about the behavior of the other. Now, this part kind of started raising questions because as a human, we're able to predict and, you know, verbalize our predictions. So if I do this, that animal is going to do this. However, how do we measure or how do we then understand what an animal predicts that we are going to do? And it becomes this cyclical problem that's pretty much impossible to solve. And so it was this that really started making me think, well, actually, that we can't measure human animal relationships based on that definition. So uh, research assistant, so Prisha Patel um, and a colleague of mine, uh, we started to kind of, again, pick it all apart, work it all through and work out actually what is it about a relationship and how are we going to potentially you know, quantify that within the zoo setting? So we redefined uh, what a human animal relationship in zoos are. Um, and it's now stated on the screen in front of you. Um, so it's that again repeated interactions between two known individuals and it's the nature of which is influenced by their historical interactions so that aspect of what we now know from the research comes into it as well and it also need to consider the content the quality and the pattern of those interactions so it's measured over a period of time it's you know the types of behaviors that are performed that creates that interaction it's the quality, so whether they're positive, negative, or neutral, and it's then the order in which these occur. So whether that's you know constantly positive, 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 negative, and so on and so forth. And it's these that will then be able or enable us to be able to measure human-animal relationships in zoos. We also highlighted a few different methods that we felt would actually be able to, to quantify these relationships. And so these are the three that we uh, decided on that we're actually going to measure all of those components. So the first one would be the voluntary approach, and that's essentially the animal walking towards um, the human, the known person. And you can time that um, so that you can measure how long it takes to be able to move to a certain location or distance away from the keeper. There's the latency and escalation. So that's the, the data that or the method that I was using in the previous two papers um, looking at you know how long it takes to perform a particular behavior and how long that takes or how many times you need to request that behavior to be performed again so if you're saying sit to your dog do you wait how long do you wait do you then say oh, sit sit and the more times you say it on the tone of your voice will change that escalation score and the final method was then linked uh, to something called qualitative behavior assessment now, QBA is a well-known method from Professor Francoise Belmsfelder um, up in Scotland. Um, and she uses this method and devised this method to be able to measure welfare. Now, again, for those of you that might recognize this method, um, it's something that as a keeper, and certainly as people you know, that work with animals on a daily basis, you just get that gut feeling. And this is the way, the scientific way of being able to measure that gut feeling of what you're seeing. OK, so it's kind of the holistic approach to measuring an animal's behavior. It's not what they're doing. It's how they're doing it. OK, so I've got a video here um, and this was one of the videos that was uh, included in the study, which I'll talk about just after it, um, after this. And I'll press play in a minute. But essentially, if you're recording it in terms of animal behavior, what you would certainly watch is, you know, first of all, the animal would have been moving towards the, the bucket or the feeder. It would then feed. It would then stop feeding, it would then feed, it would then stop feeding, and it would then you know, carry on feeding. Whereas in this particular, is it gonna work? Oh, no. Maybe my Wi-Fi isn't going to like it. Let's try this option. No, okay, let me go back. Okay, so what would happen normally is as the giraffe puts its head down to the bucket, um, 
uh, the keeper moves its hand away and then tries to reposition the bucket. And as the keeper moves their hand up, it then scares the giraffe and the giraffe falls away. And then the keeper moves the hand away and again tries it again. And it's constantly kind of toing and froing. And so in that response, you're able to measure that entire interaction between the human and the and the giraffe in this case. So it is it's quite an interesting um, battle, I suppose. And luckily for, for me, a lot of the hard work in terms of battling the scientific approaches of this method have been battled by uh, Francois Belmsfelder because it's taken a lot of work to get that work um, approved and published through welfare science. Um, but it does mean that you're looking at words such as startled, <clears throat> relaxed, anxious, bored, sociable, inquisitive, all of those um, behaviours that you kind of feel are a bit more emotional. And that's what QBA measures. And so certainly as you're watching an animal respond to a, as a keeper, you're able to then kind of monitor this and measure it on a scale. You would then measure these where you draw the line. So it involves lots of observers um, scoring this, watching these videos. They would then mark on these lines where they go and the, then the researcher would measure all of these lines and then input that. And it's that that you would then utilize to be able to create your data. So it throws out uh, data that looks a little bit like this. Um, and this is what's called a general Procustes analysis um, for, and in this particular case, it shows the um, keeper giraffe dyads. So each of these colors of the blobs, depending on what shape of the blob, um, is a different giraffe. And each of the shapes are then um, linked to the different keeper animal interactions. Okay, and as you can see from this particular graph here, the dimension going along the bottom um, is dimension two, which again, you can see goes from calm and distracted to impatient or inquisitive. And the sort of vertical um, dimension, dimension one goes from calm and confident down to anxious and startled. And again, you can start to see that there's, you know, variations in the way that the giraffes respond. Uh, to the keeper's uh, interactions. And this again goes to show and highlight even more so that those relationships between the keepers and the giraffes in this particular case um, are really varied depending upon what the interactions are. And again, just goes to show that realistically, if you've got animals that are, you know, have a higher level of fear, then actually you're potentially going to impact on sort of welfare, uh, compromised welfare as well, um, just because of watching, you know, the way that they respond around these animals, around these keepers. So that's currently where we're up to with regards to all of the current research with keepers and um, and, and animals. So in a bit of a summary, um, I put together a nice slide that hopefully kind of summarizes everything in that respect. Um, so first of all, you can see that, you know, as keeper or the amount of time that a keeper will spend with an animal in positive interactions, it's gonna have a positive impact on the behavioral performance of these animals. We also were able to show that um, with positive reinforcement training, um, that you will, might and you can reduce the fear of particular animals to humans. We're able to show that with positive reinforcement training, we're not having a negative impact on offspring interactions and might be having a positive effect on you know, the future of those offspring, but that still needs to be studied. We know that with these positive interactions, um, again, those positive, even with half the individuals of a social group, you're actually encouraging more positive interaction between the social individuals themselves. So it's not just on the individual, it's actually encouraging better affiliative behaviors between the individuals within that social group. And finally, we're able to show that actually, you know, between the, um, with, the, with all of these various different interactions, there is differences between the keeper responses. And that means that there will be some form of judgment, I suppose you could call it, um, or the way that an animal works with a keeper will differ depending upon those interactions and depending upon that relationship. So overall, we can say that realistically, um, the more you're gonna put in as an animal keeper, the more you're gonna get out. And that sliding scale of whether your animals are happy or sad or in high welfare or poor welfare is likely to depend an awful lot on you. 
And certainly, you know, I think certainly with the, the pandemic, we're able to recognize ourselves that actually positive interactions is something that as a human being, we love to have. Um, and this sort of research is actually starting to show that those positive interactions is also going to be really beneficial for the animals that we work with on a daily basis. And we need to make sure that we're prioritizing those to and those positive interactions um, so that we can be improving the welfare of our animals in zoos. And that is everything from me. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and I shall take any questions. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. It's very interesting. And uh, for all the, all the people that have worked with animals over the years, I think we can all relate to so much of that, whether we realised it at the time or not. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we'll go through some questions. We've got about 15 minutes or so. Um, we'll try not to keep everyone more than an hour. So the first question here. Um, so this one's ever since the zoo in my country closed, there have been a lot more births amongst the animals. Even the animals that were hard to breed before have now been success, have successful offspring. Uh, do you think we have to learn from this experience and give the animals in the zoo more time without visitors? That's a really, really interesting um, point. And I'd, I'd love to know more. Um, I certainly think, you know, looking at the reproductive success of species is a really good way of being able to monitor how impact or what impact we have um, on the animals that we, we look after in zoos. Um, I think it's I think it's certainly something with the pandemic as well, you know, having reduced numbers, um, you know, it might be a bit more easier to manage, although obviously, you know, we need to have the visitors within zoos to be able to pr provide the funds to do, you know, conservation work and so on and so forth. Actually looking at visitor hours and those sorts of things might be a really good way forward and certainly something that we can learn, you know, from, from that example and from the pandemic as well. So yeah, good point. Yeah, I think it would, I think it would probably, there'd be all sorts of factors, wouldn't there, on enclosure design and, and choice and control for that animal and all sorts, wouldn't it? So yeah, but but obviously visitors do as part of that equation. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, do you think birds would show similar, I guess it's latency, um, do you think birds show similar latency to cues to rhin than rhinos would? Well, there's, uh, yeah, so I was um, hoping to have a student look into this um, this year, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the birds are going through their own pandemic at the moment in the UK with the bird flu um, situation. And unfortunately, uh, she's not been able to look into it anymore. Um, but that's certainly an area that I'd, I'd love to look into more detail. Um, majority of the research that I've done, not through necessarily any, you know, dislike to birds or reptiles but generally I kind of have done a lot of work with mammals um but I think certainly you know this sort of area is you know with birds of prey with parrots you know all sorts of different birds that have, have got massive um developments in cognitive skills I think would be really interesting to look into especially with them being used in displays as well yeah no it would, would be very species dependent on that I guess but yeah excellent thank you and um one more in the in the Q&A uh, box. Um, in my experience, there are some keepers who just seem able to form better relationships with with all their animals. Is there any research into features of the keeper that might influence the type of or quality of the relationship? Yeah, I I totally agree, and I've seen that myself. You know, when I was keeping, there are people that just just have that knack. Um, and I think if we could work out what that was and, and you know, it, finding people for these sorts of jobs would be so much easier. Um, but I think it would also mean that a lot of people might not get those jobs because we can't all have that kind of bottled um, animal magic, as it were. Um, I don't know how on earth we'd be able to potentially kind of get maybe the ethics approval to be able to look at that as well. I think that might be quite a difficult and challenging route to go down um, to try and work out what it is about the you know characteristics of a person. Um, we have recently started looking at human animal bonds in zoos as well. So a team, so uh, Jeff Hosey, Vicky Melfi and a few others from a, a few of the um, international institutes 
Um, we've been looking into, you know, how keepers perceive bonds and, and whether they think that they have a bond with particular animals or not. And again, you know, the, the discrepancies according to, you know, where they currently are in the world, where they are, which zoo they work for, whether they're male or female, you know, there's so many differences um, that kind of account to, you know, our own personal perceptions of how we, we get on with animals is so vast. So I think it would be a, it would be a great question to answer, but I think it would be extremely difficult. <laughs> Good question. No, no, it is, we've all seen it where, um, you know, some animals react differently to, to some keepers. And I guess that's the experience of that individual animal um, and, 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 it, and it's time in life and, and or season or on all sorts of factors. So yeah, but it's a, a really good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, got one in the the chat. Um, so I think this was relating to um, it's about dolphins. Yeah. So uh, um, so I, I guess they're asking about how um, human animal interactions or, or, or keeper. Or, or the staff um, human animal relationships uh, would impact on any sort of conservation work as in you know reintroductions and things like that yeah I think that's a really good point and a really good um, thing to bring up because I I generally believe that animals that will be reintroduced probably shouldn't have uh, the interactions that you know that are that we kind of see within certainly within the you know the training and things along those lines um, I definitely think there's a role for zoos in terms of the ambassador role, getting people to recognise animals and fall in love with animals and feel like they connect with animals. Um, and in that sense, I think it's really key to make sure that those animals that are living in zoos on that in that sort of permanent status, I suppose, to make sure that they're as comfortable as they possibly can be. Not tame. I don't think they'll ever be tame. I certainly wouldn't ever want to, to go in and do any sort of rat tickling of uh, big cats or anything along those lines um but yeah i think you know that each animal might have their specific role and those interactions can be positive with the animals that are going to be living in zoos for the foreseeable future and then animals that might be reintroduced would need to have that kind of less um, interaction and it might even be that you would then need to try and integrate more negative interactions because you want them to be scared of humans you want them to to have that response mm. But yeah, good, good question. Yeah, it is, yeah, no, it's um, yeah, there's a balance between you know having good welfare whilst in captivity uh, and, and using some of those tools to to get that welfare. Um, but yeah, and giving them survivability once they're in the yeah. wild. So, yeah. yeah, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, some more questions coming in. Um, uh, do you think? If we were to investigate the impact of keeper animal interactions on multi species exhibits, would the impact interacts would the would impacts interact for all the species housed? Not sure if I've I think I think I, know what you mean. <laughs> I, I assume that means that if you've got a multi species exhibit, are the interactions going to be different according to the species? I think maybe mm. um, is the question or li linked to that. And I would think probably yes. Um, I think, especially, you know, it's certainly with the links with regards to the social species, if there's animals that kind of link in and follow and watch other animals, then they might learn um, how to respond. So they might have similar responses, but I think they're definitely going to respond very differently. Okay, thank you. But there's not a lot of work that's been done on mixed species exhibits. So I think, uh, you know, generally, you know, how, how they impact on behaviour, how other species impact on other individual behaviours, how they have hierarchical areas within their enclosure. There's so much work that can be done um, looking at mixed species exhibits. So, yeah, get out there and get doing some. <laughs> um, this one relates to sort of one of your last points, I think, and... and they're asking, um, do you believe the keeper working environment has an impact, or I guess the conditions for the keepers, I guess they're talking to, has an impact on animal behaviour and welfare? For example, if a keeper is unhappy, does this negatively impact animal welfare? I definitely think so. Um, and I think, I mean, I know um, there are, I think there's a couple of researchers currently looking at compassion fatigue within the keeping environment. 
um, and you know looking at job satisfaction and those sorts of things and how that will impact a lot of the farming research actually started to look at you know why is it that farmers were having such negative interactions with the the animals and you know a lot of their attitudes and their responses to animals were quite negative and that was then impacting on their negative interactions so I definitely think that would be mappable across to, to keepers um, and I think yeah job satisfaction is one of those really difficult ones that you know if you're not happy with what you're doing everything is everything is terrible no matter what industry you're in but certainly within an industry where you're working hard in all weathers um you know for little money um so yeah it's i think that will definitely impact okay um so this is about um uh, new animal arrivals into into a zoo or aquarium or, or a captive facility um so they're, they're sort of asking your opinion on sort of what would be the best way of interacting with the animals with fewer keepers, more keepers, less interactions spread out across more or less of the staff. Um, so yeah, it's um, basically how would you address um, new animals arriving and, and the best way to, to sort of get them settled in, I guess. Yeah, so I think initially it's probably a good idea to have a, a fewer number of people so they can start to build that positive interaction um, they'll need to learn things like, you know, it depends on the species, obviously, but, um, you know, the, the uniform colours, the, you know, the radios, the keys, all of those sorts of tiny, minute cues that we don't necessarily pick up on that the animals will be noticing. And so if you've got fewer people with, you know, similar kind of clothing and things like that, then that will enable them to be able to build up those interactions and positive interactions more quickly. And then you can bring in newer people. Um, you know, or you know, the rest of the team. So I would think start off, uh, you know, quite as, as frequently as you possibly can um, with a fewer number of people and obviously positive interactions. So whether that's food, uh, depending on your species, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a tickle again, depending on your species. Um, so yeah, that's probably, I would say the best way forward. Slow and steady. <laughs> okay, we've got, we got time for a couple more, I think. Um, oh, there's, there's, there's even more coming in, so we'll, we'll try and get through a couple more. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not even going to get a chance to ask any of my questions. <laughs> no, no, I've got one as well. Yeah. Oh, do you, do you get, go on, Nick. You answer your ask yours then, because oh, you, um, I've been chatting away and, and not let you have a chance to get in. <laughs> well, Sam, this is. Um, I was just thinking as you were talking about the the animal human relationships, and obviously you've been talking a lot about zoos and, and keeper relationships, but. Um, I was thinking about a lot of education facilities have specialist animal units and obviously it's a wonderful resource for uh, education but what do you think the impact of um, having those units has on the welfare of um, the animals housed in there and do you think certain species are better suited and if so which? Yeah definitely a really good point Nick um, so I think there will be definitely species that are more suitable um, and sometimes, you know, your typical pet species, so your bearded dragons, for example, they, they're so commonly, you know, seen in these sorts of institutes, and I think they're probably the best species for it. Um, they're so kind of, they're a lot more comfortable, they're a lot more used to, you know, thinking reptiles being handled and those sorts of things. And mm -hmm. it depends, I think, on what the, the, the needs are of the students in those sort of situations. Mm -hmm. If you need to have handling experience of 10 different reptiles, then I would probably work down what are the most, the, the kind of most commonly kept um, or most frequently handled sort of species and work that way. If they just need to have experience of reptiles, then I would probably pick two species and have a few different tanks and, and go down that route. Um, same, I suppose, with birds and mammals. Um, I know, you know, certainly with, with Nottingham Trent University where I am, we have quite a strict um, working practice with regards to the animals that are on our, our animal unit. So most of our mammals are uh, hamsters and gerbils and rats because we know that they can be handled quite easily. And then we've got rabbits and guinea pigs and they're on a very strict rotor. So they're only worked for two hours uh, a day or two or three hours a day. Um, mm -hmm. And then they're taken off the rotor. So they're then given time to kind of chill out. So they're classed as working animals in that sense. 
Um, and I think putting those sorts of things in place is probably quite a good idea as well, just to make sure that you're not overhandling the animals or overworking them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Go for it, Simon. What do you want me to read out those? Um, and, oh, you can if you like, Nick. Um, there's, there's two more to go. Um... Uh, OK, so do you think looking at personality profiles of keepers, this kind of feeds back into the question earlier, I think, of keepers could potentially help determine what influences AHRs and, and why some keepers form better bonds than others. So it does feed back, doesn't it, to what we were talking about earlier? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There have been a couple of studies that have tried to map um, personalities of, of animals and keepers and whether there's a, a key there. I think there was a study a few years back um, and it was on tigers. And if I remember correctly, they couldn't work out. There didn't seem to be a particular, you know, trend or a particular kind of outcome. Um, but I'd have to go back to that paper properly to have another look. But yeah, I think personalities is, is definitely an area of future research. And Certainly with the focus being, you know, on, on individuals now, it's not just a group of tigers and how they respond to a keeper, group of tigers, group of lions let go with instead. Uh, let's go with the social species. Um, but yeah, so, you know, looking at individual kind of pairings and how they respond might be really a really good idea to go down. Fab. Um, and then a quest question here, do you think gorillas would show similar reactions when they see video recordings of previous uh, keeper animal interactions? It's a good one. I have no idea, but it would certainly be good to see. Um, it would be a really interesting way. And I think, you know, all of that idea of, you know, learning, social learning, um, you know, if they see these images and they've, if they've got training with one individual and then you show the video of them, with another, would they make them more? Oh, brilliant idea. Go for it. <laughs> I can see lots of new projects starting after yeah. today. Yeah. Fab. Oh, wow. I think well, that's just... the end of it. Yeah, Go say, it's a, it's a it's a fascinating area and a growing area. And I think we will um next year, part of our webinar series, I think we need to get Sam back because there's lots more questions and lots <laughs> more to discuss. So um so yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, this evening or this morning, wherever you may be. And um, and thank you, Sam, for a very interesting and and, and a very interesting talk and, and and really getting a lot of engagement from the participants, which is great. It's a, it's a hot topic, obviously. Yeah. And um, yeah, um, thank you all for joining us. This recording is is a will will be available um, on on the World Welfare and Global Animal Welfare YouTube pages. And please follow both organisations on, on social media um, and check our websites for, for the webinar series in 2022. So, yeah, I'll just... I just... I was going to say, can I just say, if anyone has got other questions or wants to get in touch, uh, my email was on the front of the slide. So if you just want to skip back to the video um, and then contact me, I'll, I'll get back in touch with you that way. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, well, everyone have a good holiday, Christmas, wherever you may be, and um, we'll see you in 2022. See you then. Bye. Bye.